Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you, Lee, for your kind uh, words. Welcome to Learning Together. Welcome to the National Center for Research on Evaluation Standards and Student Testing. Welcome to GSC and IS. I'm very proud of CREST and our pioneering work over the last half century at the cutting edge of educational innovation. CREST has had a geologic impact shaping and reshaping the landscape of assessment and evaluation in the United States and beyond. To paraphrase, to paraphrase uh, Voltaire, if we didn't have CREST, we would have to invent it. What is CREST's secret sauce? Well, you'll get a taste of it over the next couple of days. My hunch is that it is equal parts, fearless curiosity, passion for purposeful inquiry, and an organic commitment to transform how we learn and how we teach. Over the next two days, you will create and recreate purposeful bonds to address and indeed shape the futures of education moving forward. You will delve in new data, new conceptual work, new methodologies and technologies, endeavoring to solve today's most pressing education challenges. You will be in conversation with extraordinary leaders in the academy, in the world of technology, in the public sector. Your task ahead could not be more significant. Education is more important today than ever before in human history. To quote the great H.G. Wells, civilization is, quote, in a race between education and catastrophe. Let us learn the truth, he goes on, and spread it as far and wide as our circumstances allow. For the truth is the greatest weapon we have. In our world of magical thinking, this is especially important as a mandate to keep in mind. Let me say a word about UCLA. Education is deeply ingrained in UCLA's DNA. In the United States, for our colleagues from overseas, in the United States, colleges begin one of two ways, preachers or teachers. UCLA begins with teachers. From the founding in 1882, of the state normal school, a school with its own experimental school devoted to train teachers in what was that then a sleepy pueblo in the desert to 1919 when the state normal school is renamed and relocated becomes the southern branch of the University of California, Berkeley, to the magnificent, uh, globally ranked UCLA of today, education and information studies have been at the center of the university's evolution. The UCLA Lab School is the mitochondrial DNA that gave birth to the entire university. A lab school very much shaped by the ideas of the great John Dewey, in fact, 
it opened its doors to the children of Los Angeles 15 years before Dewey imagined the University of Chicago Lab School. And here is a hypothesis for you to test. I think it's fair to say that Corrine Seeds, Dewey's student, was perhaps his most important disciple. Because 135 years later, here's a vi vibrant little school in the heart of the campus, very much inspired by the work of Dewey and the work of the great Corrine Seeds. Seeds brought Dewey to Los Angeles, the only time he visited, uh, and he gave a, he gave a talk, uh, was a force of nature. The great Corrine Seeds was hearing impaired, and she taught teachers that you can't teach if you don't listen to your students. There is an extraordinary Lacanian quality to that realization. Indeed, as the great Loris Malaguzzi, the father of Reggio children, once said, if you listen to children, this is 50 years before Howard Gardner came up with the theory of multiple intelligences, Malaguzzi said, if you listen to children, you will hear the hundred languages of children. Those hundred languages are the pathway to teaching and to learning. UCLA is so organically engaged in public edu education in Los Angeles and beyond, really unlike any other major research university uh, I've known, and uh, I have white hair, I've been around uh, quite a bit, and I've been in a number of universities, and maybe that's one of the unique features of UCLA, it's deep engagement in the nexus between research and practice. UCLA today has two demonstration schools, the UCLA Lab School and the UCLA Community School in Pico Union. We have a, a, a new um, UCLA Community School in South Los Angeles, the Horace Mann School. We also are responsible for eight, eight tie-in school that's together in education and countless partnerships in LA and beyond. Let me try another hypothesis. In the 21st century, cities and their universities and the synergies between cities and universities will be decisive, central to uh, the vibrancy of both the cities and the universities. This is new and very, very different from what we've seen today. When the Italian monks first gathered in Bologna to start what we now call universities, Bologna wasn't Rome. It wasn't the center of the empire. Cambridge and Oxford are not London. Uh, try and find the Massachusetts Bay Colony on the GPS not easy to do. Far away pastoral places were the gathering places for deep learning and for deep thinking. That's yesterday's and the world is rapidly changing. Today and moving forward, great cities will co-construct with their universities greatness in teaching, in research, in learning. Los Angeles is a unique city, and I want to welcome you to this, the great gateway city at the bridge of Asia Pacific and Latin America. This morning, 
children whose families originate in well over a hundred different countries and territories got up, had breakfast, got into bikes, got into cars, got into buses, or simply walk to schools. And here is some, something that never happened before in the history of the world. Over a dozen countries today in the world have Los Angeles as their second city. What's the second Mexican city? Second largest Mexican city. Does anybody know? Guadalajara. Guadalajara is the second largest Mexican city. Today there are more citizens of Mexico in Los Angeles than in Guadalajara. This is true for many, many other countries. Armenia, Iran, Korea, Mexico, Israel, Philippines, El Salvador, Cambodia, Laotia, Guatemala. We today are the world's second capital. Thomas Jefferson once said, we all have two cities, our own and Paris. What's there not to love about Paris, our second city? The world today has two capitals, their own and Los Angeles. This is why the city, the gateway city, the great civilizations of Asia, Pacific, and Latin America is home to so much of the world. Foreign policy recently named Los Angeles in the top half dozen global cities in the world, along with the cities you would expect, London and, and Paris and New York and uh, Tokyo and Hong Kong and, uh, and so many others. I think at UCLA we think of the world as unfolding in a global set of dynamics, global and local. Your work over the next couple of days is extremely significant, and I look forward to an update to learn about the important advances you will be making. You have amazing speakers and very important conversations. I'm very, very happy to acknowledge GSC and IS's secret weapon, a one-man nova of brilliance, clarity, and insight, our own Li Tsai. Li is a professor of educational, education and psychology in the Advanced Quantitative Methods Program at GSC and IS. He also serves as director of CREST. His research agenda involves the development, integration, and evaluation of innovative latent variable models that have wide-ranging applications in assessment, research, educational, psychological, health-related domains. So I'm very, very proud and I'm very, very happy to say that CREST is as healthy as it has ever been, and I'm delighted to publicly acknowledge Lee as our director. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And now I have to change hats, and I will no longer be the dean speaking with the uh, institutional voice. Now I'm a garden variety academic, endeavoring to share ideas about my own basic uh, research. So, good morning. I'm Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and I'm a scholar of migration and its impacts on societies, on families, and children. I'll have about maybe 30 minutes of, uh, maybe 25 minutes of um, a presentation, and then we will have some time for uh, a conversation. So, today, all continents are involved in the massive movements of people as areas of immigration, folk coming in, as areas of emigration, folk leaving, or transit, and 
often all three at once. In the 21st century, mass migration is the human face of globalization. The sounds, the colors, the aromas of a miniaturized, interconnected, and fragile world. Migration is constitutive of the human condition. It is indeed a fundamental human adaptation. Migration makes us human. Homo sapiens sapiens is the child of Homo sapiens mobilis. Migration is written in our genome. It's encoded in our bodies, in our bipedalism, in our stereoscopic vision, in our neocortex, in the human genome. Modern humans are the children of immigration. Migrations are complex, multi-determined, and not easily reduced to deterministic algorithms. Given a particular input, it produces multiple outputs. Migrations elude simply mechanistic models of causality because they unfold in complex ecologies involving demographic factors, cultural models, economic variables, political processes, historical relationships, and increasingly the environment itself. The number of international migrants worldwide has continued to grow rapidly in recent years. The largest international corridors of human migration today are in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. The largest chains of internal migration occur in Asia. China has ha had an estimated population of 245 million internal migrants moving from the rural hinterlands into the great coastal cities. In India, it is estimated that over 325 million people, more than a quarter of the country's population, were internal immigrants in the last few years of the uh, uh, decade. Over 60% of all international migrants today live in Asia or Europe. North America hosted the third largest number of international migrants, followed by Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Europe and North America today attract over half of all immigrants. Europe once led the world on immigration. From the end of the Napoleonic Wars into the first decade of the 20th century, Europe sent over 60 million souls to the New World. By now, as if by centennial design, Europe has recaptured in its entirety its lost population. The number of new immigrants that have arrived in Europe now equates the number of folk that left Europe over a century ago. There is a problem in search of an interesting explanation. Europe's struggle with the integration of its new immigrants presents an important point of comparison. So does Asia, and so does the dynamics throughout the Americas. To paraphrase Tolstoy's beautiful first sentence in Anna Karenina, when it comes to immigration, Europe and the US are families, each unhappy in its own way. In the United States, the most significant challenge is the uh, significant number of very, very large um, fa number of families in an authorized status. This may be a unique feature of our migration the problematique, especially in a comparative uh, perspective. The United States today has the largest number of immigrants in history. 
and more than four times the numbers of immigrants, the second largest country of immigration, which today is Saudi Arabia. The Russian Federation, by the way, for a long time had the second largest number of immigrants. The Russian Federation today has a very, very significant number of people leaving emigration is now the driving dynamic in the new reality in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> While there are as many motivations and pathways for migration as there are migrants, large K migration is not random. It follows predictable corridors. At the proximate level, migration is a matter of the household. Distinct patterns of kinship, family, and social organization carve the pathways for worldwide migratory journeys. The fundamental unit of migration is the family, variously defined in different parts of the world and structured by culturally coded legislative, economic, reproductive, and symbolic forms. At the distal level, migration is multiply determined by labor markets, demographic imbalances, wage differentials, technological change, and environmental factors. However, when looked up close, it is the family that makes migration work. A, an immigrant, a refugee, really, a subcategory of immigrants, Sigmund Freud, in the last interview he gave in London, in exile, was asked by a journalist expecting a lengthy discourse on the nature of the human psyche, was asked by a journalist, Professor Freud, you spend your life studying the human condition. What have you learned? What is the synthesis? Freud's famous three words sum it up. Love and work. If you can love and work, you can be a happy person. Love and work define what drives migration in the world today. It is love, the family. It is work, wage, and opportunity. It is initiated by the family and the family is deeply transformed by migration. We can say the following. One family starts the migration process, and another reconstituted family will finish, complete the process, several generations down. Love and work. This may be the most important monument to war and terror. Do you know what this is? It's the Guernica. And where is the Guernica now? It used to be in the UN, but now it's in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. It's a beautiful little museum. That's what Picasso wanted when Franco died, to send back the Guernica. Guernica is a little town in the Basque country. By the way, Orozco is a Basque name. It's a name of emigrants. My family left the Basque country many, many, many uh, years ago. And do you know what the Guernica was? It was, um, yes? I was just gonna say it's when Spain bombed the Basque country. So it's when the German Air Force, actually, with Franco's uh, permission, uh, let the German uh, Air Force, Luftwaffe, uh, use uh, Guernica as a training ground. This is the horrors of war. Historically, it was a clash of powerful nation states that was the main driver of the sudden involuntary displacement of mass populations. Two war wars, the wars of colonial liberation, the Cold War, pushed millions to seek shelter in safer lands. By the end of World War II, Europe had more than 40 million refugees, the largest in recorded history. The Second World War had another indirect impact on mass migration. 
The entrance of the United States into the war led to the creation of a guest worker program to recruit temporary Mexican braceros to labor in U.S. fields. Over half a century, that temporary guest uh, worker program led to the largest flow of immigrants in recorded U.S. history. Likewise, various temporary guest programs in Europe ended up delivering permanent immigrant populations that we now see in Berlin, in Brussels, in Rotterdam, and elsewhere. There is nothing more permanent than temporary guest worker programs. This is the lesson of the last half of the 20th century. The map tracing the great global, great global migrations, great global corridors of the post-World War II era became increasingly blurred with the dismemberment of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s and the end of the Cold War. With the worldwide economic crisis of 2008 and the anti-government uprisings affecting North Africa and the Middle East beginning in 2010, the so-called Arab Spring and the beginning of an entirely new cartography of global migration. The new map, in the words of Alexander Betts at Oxford, is populated with survival migrants, what the Jackie Baba at Harvard calls distressed migrants. Migration today is increasingly defined by the slow motion disintegration of weak states, war and terror, unchecked climate change, and cataclysmic environmental destructions. Conjointly, these forces are the drivers of what I will call the catastrophic migrations of the 21st century. They have forced more people to flee than at any other time in recorded history. Meet the new drivers of mass migration. And check climate change, geophysical hazards, increase morbidity and mortality, disrupt production, decrease agricultural yields, decimate livestock, and forcibly displace millions the world over. Extreme weather patterns, high intensity cyclones, monsoons, rising sea levels, but also droughts and hurricanes, heat waves and forest fires are the new drivers of the catastrophic migrations of the 21st century. By 2017, the majority of new displacements occurred in low and lower middle income countries as a result of large scale weather events, predominantly in South and East Asia, while China, the Philippines, and India have had the highest absolute numbers, small island states suffer disproportionately once population size is factored. Slow onset disasters, existing vulnerabilities and conflict also continue to converge into explosive tipping points for human displacement. Documented displacements due to environmental factors took place in over 110 countries across the world. Over the last decade, over 200 million displacements have been recorded, an average of 25 million each year. This defines the new map of mass migration moving forward. By the second decade of the 20th century, approximately 44,000 44, human beings were forcefully displaced every day. The catastrophic migrations of the 21st century pose risks to millions of human beings, challenge the institutions of sending, transit, and receiving nations alike, and obligate us to re-examine its causes and our responsibilities in finding solutions to an entirely new era. In 2017, there were well over 68 million forcefully displaced 
That is the equivalent of every man, woman, and child in Rio de Janeiro, Moscow, Paris, London, Lahore, New York, Islamabad, all together suddenly forced to abandon their homes. The majority of those seeking shelter are internally displaced peoples, not formal refugees across international borders. Internal displacement associated with conflict and violence has been growing since the beginning of the millennium, and 2015 saw the peak, the highest figure ever recorded. It is now twice the number of formally um, designated refugees. That's a category that is designated by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. In 2015 alone, there were almost 30 million new forced migrations associated with conflict, violence, and disasters in over 100 countries. The Middle East, more than the world combined, leads the number of war and terror displaced human beings mostly by wars of choice, by the way. In 2015, again, that's the peak. Syria, Iraq, and Yemen accounted for over half of all forcefully displaced people. Likewise, over half of all refugees under the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee Mandate originate in three states, Syria, Afghanistan, and the South Sudan. These conflicts, are disparate and incommensurable in nature, yet they share a chronic, protracted quality. Serious descent into the Dantesque Inferno has been six years in the making. The Afghanistan complex is twice as long, the largest war the United States has ever been involved in. Somalia's internal chaos lasted a generation. All of these conflicts have now endured longer than World War I and World War II combined. And in each case, environmental dystopia both antecedes and accentuates the catastrophic movements of people. Serious in the midst of the most severe drought ever recorded in human history. According to NASA data, in 900 years, there's never been a drought, the equivalent to what we're seeing today. Likewise, we read about uh, the displacement of peoples in Central America. Most, the go-to place cognitively for that is war and terror, narcotics, gangs, and the dystopia that descended upon those lands. But don't be fooled. The environment is very powerfully implicated in El Salvador. El Salvador has one of the most severe droughts in recent history. Honduras was entirely devastated after massive deforestation by the predictable cycles of, uh, of hurricanes that cyclically come to the region without the forests to absorb the uh, extraordinary kinetic force of the hurricanes, approximately three million people were displaced when Hurricane Mitch first hit. It was then that Honduras, for the first time, began making the move up north to the United States. Before that, there was no Honduran migration to the United States. The face of migrations in the 21st century is ever more youthful. Worldwide, one in every 200 children today is a refugee, almost twice the number of a decade ago. According to the most recent United Nations data, there are over 28 million children forcefully displaced. Another 20 million children were inter international migrants. Their combined number now is larger than the populations of Canada and Sweden together. Millions of children are internal migrants. In China alone, an estimated 30, 35 perhaps million children are internal migrants. Data show that in 
the 21st century, even under the best of circumstances, migration separate family members, disrupt familiar bonds. To migrate in the 21st century is to separate families. Migration is an ethical act of and for the family. Research suggests that family members the world over depend on the remittances sent by migrants living in the United States and in other high and middle income countries the world over. Last year, remittances surpassed $400 billion, more than double the combined world international aid. It's uh, India it led the world. It, India has the largest immigrant stock in the world, and it received, uh, I believe it was over $71 billion. What's amazing, and the mathematicians in the room can, can do the math, is the last part of this slide. There's a number of very small countries in the world where roughly 40% to a third uh, to a quarter of the GDP, that's the internal wealth of the nation, rests entirely on the shoulders of a tiny number of immigrants in the high and middle income countries of the world. Uh, when Wolfenson was the head of the World Bank, he invited me to the bank to review some materials and in that context, the bank said remittances today is the largest poverty reduction uh, effort in the world. This is all current use funds. You can tell in Central America, there are actually anthropometric studies. You can measure the, the um, anthropometric differences between children growing up in families that have relatives in, say, Queens or in Long Island. Uh, and families that don't have relatives overseas because of the, of the remittances. Immigration generates a powerful demographic echo. As families reunite, the children of immigrants take the center stage. The children of immigrants are the fruit born of immigration. In the United States, 26% of children under the age of 18, a total of approximately 19 million children have an immigrant parent. The growth has been extremely rapid. In 1970, the population of immigrant origin children stood at 6% of the population. It reached 20% by 2000, and it is projected to reach 33% by 2050. The children of immigrants are an integral part of the national tapestry. Their education and well-being is, touches on a large swath or, of concerns in regards to our child population. Their story is deeply intertwined with the future of the nation. This is true here, this is true the world over. Nearly every high and increasingly uh, majority of middle income countries are facing the following demographic predicament. Rapidly aging populations, below replacement fertility rates, and a ratio of workers to retirees that make the math unsustainable for moving forward. Globally, immigrant children are the fastest growing sector of the child population in disparate countries. Like Canada, over 90% of the growth in Canada moving forward will be the children of immigrants. This is also true in Italy. I was recently in Reggio Emilia, and 40% of the children in Reggio Emilia, this is northern Italy, come now from non-Italian immigrant and refugee origin homes. This is also true in Australia, in Israel. This is also true in New Zealand. In Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, two-thirds of the children that woke up this morning to go to school come from non-Dutch immigrant origin homes, two-thirds of the children. In Stockholm, the widest country in Northern Europe, 40% of the children come from immigrant and refugee origin homes. Half of the children in the state of California today come from immigrant origin homes. Half of the children in the New York public schools today come from immigrant origin homes. Now I asked the governor of California, the, we, uh, as Lee suggested, we have an initiative in the, in the Holy See. Uh, I asked the governor in, in the Vatican, how will California remain the fifth largest economy in the world at a time when half of the children come from immigrant homes? 
without redoubling, re-engineering our education to ease their transition to the labor market of the 21st century. There is the challenge for most high and middle income countries uh, today. I'm moving very fast now because I'm running out of time. Education systems around the world are facing unprecedented challenges and opportunities. This is the challenge, educating more diverse cohort of students to greater levels of competency at a time when economies and societies are more integrated and more vulnerable to global appeals. The world is also more unequal, and rising inequality has become the elephant in the classroom. Today, we have a story in urban settings the world over of concentrated disadvantage, massive segregation and resegregation, and a widely acknowledged general failure to fully integrate large numbers of children of color. The racialization of poverty and the growth of inequality lives in its form in multiple contexts today, and it remains the greatest challenge for education systems, for democracies the world over. This is data from my colleague Greg Duncan at UC Irvine, and it tells you something that is deeply uh, worrisome. The best predictor of who's going to get into college, and more importantly, who's going to graduate from college, is your zip code in, uh, in our country. What principles, then, ought to animate our conversation about education as a public good in this 21st century of increasing interdependence, increasing fragility, and increasing interconnectedness? Education is highly relevant to move the human needle, and today we have a much fuller understanding of the causal pathways by which education generates better health, a more muscular citizenry, and patterns of status mobility. Education at heart, when it was imagined by the Greeks, was imagined as being driven by the idea of eudaimonia, the flourishing of the child. We also know that moving forward, education will play a critical role in shaping the course of economic and social transformation, remaking the world. Suffice it to say that there's a strong corpus of economic, demographic, psychological, sociological, and educational research mapping the effects of education, measured most often by years of schooling, by literacy very broadly, on individual socioeconomic mobility, what we call human capital, social cohesion, social capital, health, and well-being. The preponderance of evidence for some time now is hardly surprising. Schooling tends to generate powerful virtuous cycles. And here I need to stop for a minute and reflect on a marginal note the great Charles Darwin wrote when he was writing the diaries. There is a handwritten note in one of the diaries that says simply, educate girls, twice the impact. Indeed, the most exciting of the new findings is the nexus between schooling, literacy, and health outcomes throughout the world. And here, the, the work of my former colleague at Harvard, Bob Lemine, and Catherine Snow is very, very significant. Also, David Bloom and so many, so many, uh, so many others. Literacy literally saves lives. In the global era of mass migration, schools the world over are pursuing multiple normative ideals, instilling 21st century skills and competencies, fostering cohesive social relations, and crafting the tools needed for immigrants to engage as effective and transformative citizens and workers in their new societies. The most important challenge, as far as I can tell, is endeavoring to disrupt gaps in achievement, 
in language, including language loss. The, our country is a cemetery for languages. Uh, Japanese brought Japanese, it died. Germans brought German, it died. The Italians brought Italian, it died. We need to f uh, disrupt this. The best uh, data in cognitive neuroscience through neural, uh, neural uh, imaging suggests that the crown of the human achievement, a product of, uh, of human evolution, the so-called executive function, is measurably different from children who are monolingual, children that are um, uh, multilingual. So this is a, a, a central part of, uh, of and I'm uh, right on time. While the results of education, practical, should be lauded, that ought to be the beginning and not the end of the conversation. I think today we're in urgent need to re-examine the purpose of education in the new world. What are its relationships to a happy life, to the culture of dignity that we are so sorely missing in so, so many countries today? How can education be put to the service of freedom, of dignity, of solidarity, of lifelong engagement? While these essential questions have been part of the archaeology of education in many traditions, Western and many, many other traditions alike, globalization, I submit to you, subverts the parochial tendency to limit our conversations to local realities in bounded nation states. The paradox remains that while all education is local, the deep problems that face our future and hence our children are indisputably global. The tensions between these two powerful truths are increasingly obvious. Only the education of all children will lead us out of the paradox that we live local lives in global contexts. Thank you very much. So, uh, I, I think we can still have about uh, 10 minutes for questions and discussions. Thank you. Yes? Yes? I'm wondering how to put this into practice with um, policy and especially with what's going on right now in our own country but just in the world so if if we have this research I'm just how do we how do we make it actionable for for real change so people don't continually suffer and inequities don't continue to not just exist but just are so pervasive I know that's a lot yeah thank you uh, uh, thank you so much for the question so on the first part of your question which is on the matter of the forcefully d displaced uh, populations two or three things that are fundamental extremely important to keep in mind one in ten forcefully displaced refugees is going to make it to a country like the United States or like Germany, or like um, Australia, or like New Zealand, or like Canada. Nine in 10 will remain either internal, within the boundaries of uh, increasingly dystopic nation states, or will be pushed over the, the border to equally weak nations that have no institutional capacity to manage and metabolize meaningfully in a, in a humane, in a humanistic way, large numbers of uh, displaced uh, populations. One in 10. The vast majority of young people, remember, for the first time in human history, half of all forcefully displaced are children, will make it to a safe school in a country like the Netherlands or New Zealand or uh, Germany or uh, Canada. The vast majority will stay in displaced camps, camps that have no institutional capacities. The entire architecture set up by the international community 
mostly after the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust, uh, flowing from the Geneva Conventions, are anachronistic and no longer serve the fundamental purpose. The concept, the, the intellectual anchor of the Geneva Conventions was the notion of non-refoulement. The idea that nation states would not send back people until their countries were safe for re-entry. What are we to do then in a world where unchecked climate change, where never-ending war and terror are destroying the fundamental institutions of civilization to serve children, to serve human beings, to flourish to their uh, uh, potential. Today, you are a child in Syria, and you're displaced. Chances are you're going to end up either internally displaced in Syria, or you're going to be moved to a camp maybe in Turkey, maybe in, uh, uh, in, in Jordan, maybe elsewhere. The data, we are releasing a major volume with the Pope Francis's academies. The average length of displacement today for children is 20 years. Your entire childhood, youth, and emerging adulthood will be spent today in a displacement camp. So the idea, the structures in place flowing from the Geneva Conventions and the good work the folk at the United Nations and elsewhere are endeavoring to do is anachronistic, is disconnected from the realities of displacement in the 21st century. So that is an extremely um, urgent matter that needs to be addressed. We now have a much clearer understanding. If you left the South Sudan, very unlikely that you're going to be able to return anytime soon. Therefore, the ideas that gave life to the Geneva Conventions, beautiful and ethical as they were in their original condition, no longer apply. We need to endeavor uh, to develop a completely new architecture for the new cartography of the catastrophic migrations. On the matter of inequality in the high and middle income countries, this is the gravest threat to uh, democracies that we now face. And you know, Thomas Piketty, the eminent French economist at the Ecole des Institutes, wrote a book a few years ago, two or three years ago. Uh, it's called Capital in the 21st Century. This was a book like uh, Mary and Hernstein wrote. Hernstein was my neighbor in Cambridge, by the way. It was a book about this thing and nobody read. People pretended to read or read a few chapters and then you know, sat on a coffee table. Piketty's book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, is, a, is an extraordinary corpus of, of, uh, of economic um, insight. And uh, a, a lot of it is focused on the nature of inequality, poverty, uh, education. And Piketty's main uh, conclusion is not that um, um, surprising. Uh, education is the only tool, other than a massive Bernie Sanders-like redistribution mechanism, a mechanism that I don't see being actualized anytime soon anyway in the United States, maybe in other countries. Other than a massive redistribution initiative, education is the only tool it is the distribution of knowledge, of skill, of competency that best enable folk at the lower end of the opportunity structure to catch up. This is the phrase that Piketty uses in French. It sounds much better than catch up, by the way, um, to create more equality. So I go back to Tolstoy. Each country is unhappy in its own way when it comes to the nexus between education, inequality, and the current condition of, uh, of the world. In the high and middle income countries, inequality remains today the most corrosive force to the basic institutions of society. We have a massive segregation of children. This is true in the United States, but this is also true in Europe, and I will defer to our colleagues from Asia 
uh, to reflect upon um, that in your conversations. Um, and um, as populations become uh, separated, the challenge becomes how do we reimagine and reengineer the social contract when the generations look so different? The only sector of the population that is growing in, our, in the United States is the children of color. I did a little project in Arizona. Arizona is a state that has the greatest generational asymmetry. All folk are white, European origin Americans. The kids are all kids of color in the schools. How then do you re-engineer the social contract when the generations look so different? Bringing people together, multiple cultures, has amazing consequences, positive consequences for creativity, problem solving, communication, and the ability to think much more broadly. However, there are also incompatible uh, cultural tropes and, and beliefs and such that clash, uh, whether it's you know, the role of women or you know, which religions have primacy, a variety of uh, biological practices around uh, children and their upbringing and surgical treatments and so forth. How, how are there good examples of how to manage those really difficult clashes in practices in the course of trying to integrate cultures without just simply losing the original culture? Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. That's, a, that's a, such an important question. 30 years ago, I was teaching in Paris at the Ecole des Odetudes, and uh, we, I wrote for the American Anthropological Association a, a special volume addressing fundamentally this issue, what do you do with the incompatible cultural practices that are seen as incommensurable and they can't be uh, easily uh, mediated. So I think that this is a very, very important. And interesting, they flow mostly from kinship and social organization ideas of who can marry whom, at what age, uh, is marriage uh, arranged, or is it a choice, and, uh, and the like. These are very, very fundamental to culture and to, uh, and to, um, and to identity. So uh, the ch challenge is, is, uh, is severe. It's not an easy, this is not an easy uh, set, of, uh, set of issues. Uh, having said that, I think that we now know um, of a extraordinary uh, best practice uh, cases uh, all over the world. And we need to, to harvest and we need to learn from, uh, from these initiatives. A, a few years ago, I was asked by the Bertelsmann Foundation, I think it's the largest European foundation uh, now, uh, they were endeavoring to give the Bertelsmann Prize, which is the German Nobel Prize, to a city or a program or a, an initiative that the best um, um, address the very question, sir, you, you ask. How do you manage the complexities of diversity in the 21st century? And this was done in a very Germanic, Berlesman way, very systematic, very studious. We worked for months and months and months on this. And finally, the, the, uh, the Berlesman Award went to the Toronto Public Schools. Uh, Toronto, Canada is at the forefront of so many issues. Uh, Canada has a rate of immigration higher than the U.S., and all the growth in Canada moving forward is the immigrant and refugee origin population. My first thought was, right, it took a crack-smoking mayor of Toronto to produce the best schools for immigrant and refugee children. That's a joke, but uh, beyond that, I think that we can learn a great deal about the Canadian approach to the whole child, the Canadian approach to the um, engineering of, of, of schools is really different than the way we may typically think about, uh, about schools during the sort of current modern era of mass mandatory public education. Just like the schools in Toronto, there are amazing initiatives, Sweden, is do, in, doing a lot of very good work uh, in, um, again, 40% of the kids in Stockholm are non-Swedes today, coming from refugee and immigrant origin homes. Uh, there are 
very, very good examples that take, take the whole child, take the community. Uh, language is a point of entry, but we can't be fetishistic and reductionistic about uh, language. Language is a piece that needs to be addressed, but we need to endeavor also to worry about language loss as young people gravitate towards the, the, uh, the new language. There is important work in the non, in the mind and brain, in socio-emotional uh, development. Uh, one of our colleagues just wrote the, a, a piece in The American Psychologist. Her name is Carola Suarez Orozco. Very rare that you would have Suarez Orozco as the, the last name, but the, that's a statistic freak. Maybe Lee can help it, uh, help us understand. Uh, addressing sort of what works in dealing with the, uh, the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of complexities. Um, that we are uh, that we're talking about. I think that the nation states um, have uh, boundaries. Uh, the the, the West, uh, post Westphalian notion of sovereignty flows from the integrity of of national borders, and uh, crossing the national b border fundamentally needs that mutual adjustments will need to be made. This is um, I was asked by the. Uh, by the German Chancellor to give a presentation to the German Foreign Office on global migration, and uh, my soft message was really hard because I said, look, the United States today, after 150 plus years of mass migration, we've learned a, a thing or two. And what we learn is that it, it typically works, it works very well, the data on this are overwhelming, uh, uh, the national um, the national uh, study of immigration by Mary Waters, my former colleague for the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering shows very powerfully that immigrant children arrive with hope, with optimism, uh, they're engaging, we are managing the transition of immigrant kids very well. They're probably learning English today faster than the Italians learned English 120 years ago in Red Hook in the Lower East Side when they, uh, when they arrived. What's worrisome is that the health indicators uh, seem to decline rather than improve uh, over, uh, over time. Uh, immigrants, even this is a, somebody's going to win the Nobel Prize when they figure this out. Immigrants are poor than the non-immigrant native population, but they have much better health outcomes. And this supports everything we know about the nature of the relationship between health, education, and wealth. So uh, there are exemplary uh, cases, uh, Israel, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, in Europe, in our country. I'd like to invite all of you to come. I'm going from here to the UCLA Community School in Pico Union. This is something like 90% of the kids come from immigrant-headed uh, households. And these are schools, the international network schools in New York City, are schools that are, um, have developed uh, a secret sauce, and it works. The kids make the transition to their new society, and they're engaged, uh, they're thriving, um, they are doing better than ever before. When it comes to immigration, this is my parting words. It's out of Dickens. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. More children of immigrants are getting into UCLA, they're getting into Harvard College, they're getting into Yale, is Yale or jail. More immigrant kids are also coming under the supervision of the criminal justice system. And it is this dimorphism that we need to understand, that we need to disrupt, so that we can harness the energies, the optimism that come with immigration. You know, the great Kierkegaard once said, we live lives looking forward. This is, again, in our stereoscopic vision in the, in the structure Fund, the fundamental structures of our, of our cognition. But we only understand things looking backwards. We understand, looking backwards, that we've succeeded as a country managing and thriving with immigration. The question is, what is different today 
and what, how can we use what we've learned to make migration work for all children? Thank you very much.